Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. You should Google 155 West 11th Street, New York. Oh my, a 17-story, 67-unit building with recent sales of almost $20 million per unit. Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, owns a condo there, and I'm sure it is just one of many residents. Recently, some protested there, accusing Schultz of union busting. Let's talk with a barista who was fired for the audacity of trying to organize a union shop at Starbucks. A real Daniel and Goliath story. Warm greetings, everybody. This is a podcast that Greg and I have been looking forward to doing. Uh, we're here with Angel Krempa. Hi, Angel. Hi, Pat. How are you? And you are in New York, correct? Yes, I'm up in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, okay. And uh, I'm on the in the West Coast, and Greg is in uh, Pittsburgh. So, uh, Angel, you, I, I think, uh, I don't know if people know you or not, but I think they all know Chris Smalls, who was the person that organized Amazon. And I call you the Chris Smalls of uh, Starbucks. You were one of the first persons that took on Starbucks just recently and uh, successfully uh, organized a union unionization movement. And then, of course, was uh, was uh, uh, fired uh, uh, for that, which is there's a good story there we'll get into. Uh, and you were a, a shift supervisor until what, uh, about two months ago? April 1st. Uh, oh, April Fool's Day. Okay. I, the least funny joke they could have made. Yeah. Well, I, I want to let you know that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you out with a little bit of a Starbucks uh, uh, t-shirt on. I, I did that just for you. So I get extra credit for that. So We, we love the representation. Good. So tell us a little bit about your, your story, your history with Starbucks and how you got involved with the union and fill us in on what, uh, uh, on your background. Yeah. Um, so I started working for Starbucks in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic hit and it, I was also finishing up my bachelor's degree at the time too. So it was a really perfect, uh, work-life balance sort of job uh -huh. where you were able to work and go to school at the same time. So I loved that ability, but a month into working for them, the announcement of the COVID-19 pandemic happened and all of the stores shut down. And when we reopened their safety procedures were asinine and we were told that we were essential workers. That's why we had to open back up so quickly and we were not treated as essential workers. They gave us a pay raise that they took away within two months because the pandemic was over for them, but not for everybody else. And there was a lot of uh, mismanagement that happens within Starbucks as well due to just how large it is and how mismanaged uh, upper corporate has been with themselves. So with a lot of the COVID-19 pandemic weighing down on myself and my coworkers, as well as extremely poor management, we were having enough. We had to call what Starbucks's version of human resources to get a coworker fired because they were harassing everybody. And we were not being backed by Starbucks. And at the same time this was happening where we were finding our voice as a store, Jazz Brizak came up to me and asked if I knew anything about the union movement and if I wanted to join in. And it was an immediate, of course, of course I'm going to join, of course I want to help because this is everything that I want. A union mm -hmm. is trying to help. Tell us a little bit about Jazz. She was just in the New York Times, yes. had an article about her just recently. Yeah, so Jazz Grzak is a Starbucks worker who helped really, in my opinion, she is the Chris Smalls of the movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She has rallied thousands of workers behind her. And she came up to me back in August when this all started out and asked if I wanted to help. And 
she is a phenomenal person who ended up decreasing her work time availability because Starbucks has been retaliating against her store. She is from the Elmwood store, the first store to win the union election in the States. And so she decreased her availability recently so that her comrades could get the work hours that they were giving her because they couldn't afford to live. And now Starbucks is forcing her to go on a leave of absence because her availability isn't enough for them, even though in their bylaws it is. And with being forced onto a leave of absence, that is Starbucks's way of forcing her out of the unit. And that is basically them firing her without her having a say in it. And she's a Rhodes Scholar and is yeah. not a very smart lady and yes. just, just saw things were not being dealt with right and said, I want to do something about this. And, and the parallels with the Amazon, the reason they organized, again, they had all these protocols of uh, safety that were being violated. They weren't giving the workers information. They were um, you know, it, it, part of the reason why that union started was, again, they felt the workers were being mis mistreated and weren't getting answers. And that's kind of what you were seeing on your situation, too. So. What is it like to work at, uh, at Starbucks? What is it like uh, uh, when you started it there? Is, it is overwhelming. It is so overwhelming every single day. Um, I, you're... I worked at McDonald's and I was not harassed like I was at Starbucks by customers. Um, and McDonald's is always that place. Everyone's like, no, those are the worst customers. The worst customers are Starbucks customers because they are, they feel entitled because corporate allows them to feel entitled. And we're not empowered to check people on their entitlement as well. We're told if we are being harassed, um, that we protect the person who's harassing us. We make sure that they feel safe. We protect the customer before we protect each other. So, and that's written into our protocols as well. Like that's something that when they force us into do our retraining, it's what we read. Uh, we read that the customers are the greater priority over ourselves. And so there are multiple times where we've had our comrades harassed physically and verbally by not only uh, employees, but as well as customers. And we're told to deal with it, just deal with it and move on. I was harassed by a man for months and he found me on my social media. And the day corporate found out about it, months afterwards, they fired me a week later. Right, right. So it really is a protect the customer first mentality with the they, company. They kind, of created a, they kind of created They kind of created the mistake around a barista, you know, I mean, that's, kind of an elite job and you know it's important it's a skill do they pay accordingly i mean it is is it an elite skill or what, no. what is what is the no. how does it feel to work there what's it like to to be i, I, have, the, I have the numbers right here greg the <laughs> this is tacoma the average barista makes between nine and fourteen dollars an hour averaging eleven uh a retail shift supervisor which is what you were correct angel Correct. Average is about $14 an hour. So it's about $20,000 a year. Yeah. And uh, the by way of contrast, I looked up, um, I graduated from college and then worked a year as a union laborer in Illinois and was in the, the, in the union as a, as a laborer, you know, construction worker. And I made uh, $7 and uh, 50 cents an hour and had full medical benefits and you know all of the things associated with the union. That'd be equivalent to about $50 an hour today's in today's uh, wow. salary. So I think that's one of the things that, that you were complaining about is, or that most people are complaining about, even though the corporate profits of Starbucks are going up, 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 up. We saw a little bit of a dip there in the red during the pandemic, but they are certainly a very, very profitable company and wages aren't keeping up. How do, how do you live up $20 uh, to $20,000 a year? I, I don't you, know. you don't, <laughs> you don't live off of it. You, most of my comrades have multiple roommates because they can't afford it. I was 
very lucky enough. And so New York is different. I, as a shift supervisor, was making $20 an hour. But before, as a barista, it, I, it was 14 So it was a $6 jump. And I said, I, of course, I'm going to take that. But the other thing, too, is a shift supervisor, they won't tell you this, a shift supervisor is equivalent to a general manager of a restaurant. That is all I do. I am a general manager. I can put down, but general managers can live. I can't live. My comrades can't live. It's insulting when we're making a drink that costs $10 and we don't see that. And that's just one drink out of a five drink order. And that drink order is now $60. And that's most for some people who only work four hours that day, that's more than what they're going to make all day. Right. And they made, they made that for the company within five seconds. Right. So it's extremely insulting because we're asking for more help as well as more robust um, health care packages. And they're like, no, it's perfect. But then you have a majority of us, myself included, who do suffer from disabilities and who do suffer from chronic health issues. And I, the health insurance I and most of my comrades would have to take out has a minimum $2,000 deductible. Oh, Jesus. We can't afford that. Yeah. And But they keep touting that they have these benefits. They're the first to give these benefits. So we should stop asking for more. Uh, when Howard Schultz came to Buffalo back in October, he told us that we were ungrateful children for organizing this union because he's given us all these benefits and nobody asked him to do that. Nobody said that he needs to give health care insurance or nobody told him he should make sure that his employees can get to college and so we were told that we are asking for too much and it is unfair on him that we are asking to be better represented and to have a seat at the table because Howard and the rest of corporate lets us know that in every board meeting there is an empty seat at the board to make sure that they represent or that they remember their employees that are in the background. Well, no, the associate uh, team members, uh, partners, a uh, family. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what what else do what else do they call you to to you know make sure that they are. They, partners they, is the most insulting word, and they use it every second that they can. Yeah, and they do it because they automatically enroll us in stocks, and that's their way of saying no. You're really a partner but they illegally fired me and I was, I can't collect those stocks. I, right. I, I have no, like I, and they don't teach you how to enroll in stocks as well. So they call you a partner and say, you have these stocks, but unless they teach you, you're not actually enrolled in them. So it's extremely insulting. And for a while we were trying to take back that word um, in a power move, but that's not a word that we want to take back, I think, anymore. I'm not a partner with Starbucks. They're not, we're not equal. And we need to stop thinking of ourselves as equal. We will be equal when we have contracts. So but not Dad, yet. When Pat and I were your age, there's a, quite a gap, but we were your age. And I came from a working class background. But if you had a college degree or if you're getting a college degree, or if you just got out of high school, there were good paying union jobs. Pat gave an illustration. I was uh, a member of the Teamsters Union for uh, one summer. I worked uh, uh, moving in storage. Uh, I worked in a shoe store, but I, you could make decent money. And then of course, when you got through your AB or BA, you could make pretty good money. But those days are kind of gone. Uh, what's it like to be in your twenties uh, today with a college degree? Do you have a lot of student debt? Do you have student debt? I, uh, I, have we didn't, student I didn't have student debt. I had none. I came from, a working class background, I had zero student debt, graduate school, zero student debt. So for me, it's unimaginable to, to get your degree and have to pay money back. Yeah, it, it's actually extremely insulting in this moment too, because at the moment, uh, federal student loans are supposed to be on hold. We're not supposed to be paying them. And the federal government has been after me every month, making sure that I'm paying my student loans. And here I am blacklisted from being able to get a new job because Starbucks makes sure that I can't. So I'm trying to pay for student loans for I, my degrees in 
international relations. This is, I fit right where I'm supposed to. It, this was a beautiful movement that I'm so glad to have fallen into. So to have a degree to where I have an educated background in everything I'm talking about and I can't use it and I have to pay for the fact that I used it now, it's, it's really disheartening. And for a while I was like, I don't know if I can even continue on with organizing because how am I supposed to when there's so much financial debt hanging over my head that I have no control over? I can't even get a job right now, but no matter what, the union keeps showing up and they show up with open arms and they say, this isn't right. I'm sorry, this took so long. Let's figure this out. Let's figure it out. And so there's a lot of moments where I'm disheartened, but when my comrades come up to me and they're like, I didn't know, let's fix this right now. I feel supported, unlike how Starbucks has made, as well as any job I've worked has ever made me feel. So even though we don't have a contract and even though I am struggling very much, I feel most supported throughout this movement because of the people involved. Let's talk a little bit about Howard Schultz. I start each of our podcasts with an introduction and, and you, you haven't heard the introduction, but it, it goes something like this. Uh, I was looking at the protests in front of Howard Schultz's uh, apartment at 155 West 11th Street in New York. And if you Google or go to Zillow and look at those apartments, some of them sell, sell for $20 million. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know that's not his only apart, apartment. That's one of many. Perfect. So there's this, there's this um, great amount of wealth that's pouring into a few small people. And as you're saying, why can't, it's a profitable company. They've made uh, huge profits, all but just a little dip in the pandemic. And yet the, it seems as if they have a model of overworking and, and, and underpaying as an intentional business model to kind of keep the churn going um, to control the workforce. I, is that how you see it too? Do you think it's part of their business model? Oh, it's definitely a part of their business model. I, I can't tell you how many people I've seen just break down on the floor because they don't know how to keep up with the business anymore. And then we're told by our store managers that it's our fault that we can't keep up. But you have people doing the job of four different people at every single point. And the way Starbucks uh, says it is that if you are not constantly working, if you are not constantly doing something, you are not working hard enough. If you are not, if there is a moment where you can talk to a customer and you're not, that's your fault. We are made to feel that it is only on us as the baristas and the shift supervisors to make sure that we can make the store run. So there's a lot of pressure um, that they, it's written into our rules. One of the things too, when I was training for my shift supervisory is you are not only a shift, you are a barista, you are as well the top person in the store because you know, your store manager isn't there when there's shift supervisors. So we're told that we have to do this and we love that you do this. And, but if you don't do it well enough, um, that's on you. And it's, it's just disheartening as a worker because I get, like I worked for McDonald's and they didn't even hold us to that standard. Well, um, something's happening though. So, uh, yes. because uh, there are 9,000 stores and a couple of months ago, there weren't any union stores and there's 175 now and they're having more and more oh, uh, momentum for organizing these stores. And that gets me to the deliberate um, efforts of Starbucks to desperately try to put a lid on this and stop this union uh, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love this here, uh, this twit, uh, tweet here. Uh, why is the president of Starbucks Northwest American, Roseanne Williams, sweeping our floors in Buffalo? Our floors are fine. Clean up your union campaign. And that is a picture of the, and you can see in the background, there's an elderly lady there sweeping sweeping the floors and that's the 
that's the president of Starbucks Northwest, but she she recently quit. Why why did she quit a couple of days ago? What's your thought about that? So, to make it even worse, she is the president of North America. Okay. The entire North America. She was flown out here by Howard Schultz back in September to bust the union effort. Right. Um, and she did obviously the worst job you ever could. <laughs> um, the movement keeps growing and we are moving at an increasing and accelerating rate. And she said um, in multiple articles that she was not in Buffalo. Um, she was not here to union bus. She was not here for that long, but here I am. And here is James, who was the one who took that photo. Um, she was here for four months. She had an apartment in Delaware North where we know it because she told us she gave partners, coworkers, employees, her phone number to make sure that we could contact her. So we know that she was here and she did such a terrible job at busting the union that Howard said that I can't have you in my, uh, in oh, my corporate so room anymore. Pushed, they won't say out. that. They won't say that. They said that they resigned, but here's the thing. Uh, Kevin Johnson resigned. Right. Kevin Johnson was forced out because he did a lousy job at busting the union. Right. He made the corporation look bad for the corporation. And that's what Rossanne did as well. Rossanne said that she wasn't here, union busting didn't happen, that she loves everybody. But when I met her, she didn't even know how to make a drink. Um, and she's supposed to be the president of North America Starbucks. She couldn't make a drink. She couldn't use a headset for the drive-through. The only thing she knew how to do was wash dishes improperly, uh, sweep, and take out garbage. That's all she did. So when you say that you are a partner to the public and she did a numerable amount of times, we can find multiple articles of her saying that she is a Starbucks partner and everything like that. Um, she's not a Starbucks partner. She is a corporate partner. And the public saw that because we would not let up. We won't let lies take over the reality of what's been going on. So the public got very upset with Ross Ann Williams. And I think it finally um, became too much for her. Um, it was too much. And I think she finally was like, I lost. Right. And so she had to step away. And I think corporate made her do that. We all think we do. I mean, from day one, when this union effort started, we knew Kevin Johnson was going to resign and Howard was going to come back. And it happened. Right. We knew Ross Ann would lose her job because she did such a bad job at busting the union. And here it is. And we were at the Labor Notes Conference this past weekend in Chicago when we found out and we immediately started chanting about it. And all of a sudden, all these unions were chanting about fuck Ross Ann Williams. Thank God Ross Ann Williams is gone. So it is the worst person in the world finally having um, justice served to them. Did, did you start cheering? Let uh, let's go, Rossanne. Let's go, Rossanne. Like, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> we well, said fuck Rossanne. We oh, weren't that okay, nice. <laughs> right, okay, good. right. So here's here's something that I, I I watched a YouTube video and I want you to talk about this. No, normally, when somebody is trained as a new barista, you come into the store and you get trained by the people you're working with, and you <laughs> you know are shadowed by someone to make sure you're doing everything right. And as a part of the union busting effort, they now are centrally training everybody in one location. So not only can they train them, but they can also indoctrinate them about how horrible these radicals are at these various stores that they're going to be pushing them out to. So these, these young people get trained, they go to the store and they find out that this, these demonized employees are actually very caring and very nice and, you know, have, have good intentions. And so the training then backfires because they realize, wait a second, I, I was being manipulated here. I'm being given propaganda and it, it ended up making them stronger 
in yes. support of the, is, did I get that story relatively correct? That is absolutely correct, because that is how my store won our union election. Back in October, they illegally closed down the Walden Anderson location in Buffalo. I ended up filing and petitioning for my union the same time that that store did. Our election was the same day, and it is now eight months later, and they are still in limbo on if they have a union in their store or not. Um, now, what happened there is they did close it down and they had only corporate people training them. And it backfired so badly. And the thing too, by closing down that store, they took away, and having everybody trained there, they took away an essential role that they created, which is called a barista trainer. Mm -hmm. I am one. And what happens when you are a barista trainer, you are the one who, you know, new person comes in, they learn from you. You get a, I believe it was a $100 um, bonus for each person that you train. So they sent these people to the Walden Anderson location to train. And as a union busting tactic, I was the one who had to retrain six people at once. And they didn't know how to make a drink, how to wash dishes, how to properly sweep. And I was not paid at all for training six people. And on that day that I was training them all, they're the ones who came up to me and asked, so what about the union? Because I was wearing a pin and everything like that. And I, that's who I, I was the union rep in the store like that. And it was beautiful because every single one of them signed a card right in front of me right that moment, even though they went through a hellish training period in a closed down store. And that's the story that we keep seeing throughout not only Buffalo, but in these areas where they did close down a location or they are centralizing training in one store is that when they're not vetted properly, they're not vetting to make sure that um, communists and stuff like that, or prop, or like <laughs> people who are in with the union are not in training because, you know, a lot of us were smart. We know the talking points that a corporate bullshitter will say and everything like that. So when they were done with their training and they went to the home stores, they went up to the person with the union uh, pin and they asked them. And a lot of times it was not, what's the union? It is where is the union card? Right. How can I sign? It was that because they dealt with such improper training that they knew that they had to help out the store that they were going into. You know, it's such a good story because the associates, the team members, the family, the partners are the workers, not the not this huge corporation that is using that as a, uh, a platitudes for their own manipulation. It is truly the people that are helping each other that have the same circumstance. Starbucks as an, as an in, in an industry, it's an industry where the workers are essential. I mean, there is no, more than most industries, there is no Starbucks, there is no uh, uh, chain of coffee houses without people, without the people and the way they relate to other people uh, and what they do there. That, everything comes from the labor of the people there and it makes them most vulnerable. And I think that's why they fight so hard to defeat unionization because if the workers do get organized and do make demands and do recognize themselves that they're the essential component in making Starbucks successful, mm -hmm. they'll make greater demands and they deserve greater demands. It's apparent to anyone that, that hears this story. So that's, I think, why Schultz and and I'm sure he has many consultants and many lawyers that are advising him are pressing so hard to stop this. It's oh yeah, I agree. And the thing too that we've, the biggest and most helpful thing that we have done is just admit that we don't know anything and we need to educate ourselves and we need to educate our coworkers. And the biggest thing that has really rallied people is the understanding that Starbucks is a transnational corporation. A transnational corporation is not a family. They have vetted interests, not in anything else but themselves. They make more money than countries do. How is that a family? 
And that is a lot of the realizations that a lot of people have come to, to realize we have to unionize. Uh, They make more money than a lot of countries do. Why don't the people see it? They have power over multiple countries. Let, let's Why? talk about let's talk about Schultz and um, the National Labor Relations Board. Mm-hmm. And I, I watched before I came on this morning. I watched his corporate uh, d- talk where he basically, I believe, was making statements that were illegal, which is saying yep. <laughs> we are going to give everybody raises at Starbucks, but if you unionize, we're just forced to not be able to give you a raise because you're negotiating a contract. And so, you know, it's just, it, it, to me, that sounded like, how can that be legal? Is it, is it me or do you think that was pushing the line too? It is entirely illegal. I remember just last week, I think it was, he was in another um, press conference with the New York Times and he said verbatim, in a response back to if you will negotiate uh, in good faith with the union, he said no. He outwardly said no to that question. And it is illegal. And the issues as to why it's taking so long for the NLRB to um, give the workers justice for what he says is because we have very loose labor laws in the United States. Um, And that does have to do a lot with the Reaganomics And that's where a lot of the changes happen, where corporations were given the ability to, in in essence, in my opinion, work independently of the government. And that's where we have a lot of these issues with the labor laws, as well as the NLRB is so underfunded that they can't keep up with what's going on. So they're underfunded. And they're having to negotiate these extremely loose labor laws, even though Howard literally said, no, I'm not bargaining in good faith. They don't have the backing of the government to help them make sure that they hold these corporations accountable. And so like on July 11th, we start our NLRB trial where we filed over 200 unfair labor practices um, within Buffalo. And myself and my comrades are named all over it because, you know, it's a personal issue. It is a working class issue. And as of like today, we are prepping for that because this is going to be making American labor history. All of these issues are making labor history. The Memphis Seven just finished the beginning of their trial with the NLRB um, just this past week and it went phenomenally but labor law and u.s labor law and u.s laws make sure that everything goes very slowly for the worker Um, and it protects the corporation and it protects the people who can pay off the government so that's where we're at now and we're just waiting for time to stop and allow us to breathe yeah when you decide you want to organize a union and all of a sudden Corporate is sending you five brand new employees that you don't know anything about that are all of a sudden next to you because they're trying to delude the delude the workforce with these pro uh, anti union ringers that are I, 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 that can't be legal. No, it's it's part of the history of the labor movement. I mean, it's not yeah. new. It's yes. been it, it's always been there. They've always had. They've, that's why they have probation periods. You know, the probation periods are generally for for industrial unions. If if they want to fire you for any reason in the first months of your probation, that's when they find out if you're a red or if you're, mm-hmm. you're somehow going to be organized unions, you're gone. And there's no recourse. Labor laws do not allow any recourse in that probationary period. So the laws are the laws are are skewed against workers. And I think that's something that has to be conveyed to all workers. You can't really yeah. depend on the NLRB. They're not really your friends. Yeah. I mean, not, not that you shouldn't use them, not that you shouldn't get all you can, but they're not really your friends. Tell me, what'd you, what'd you learn from the World Federation of Trade Union Congress? Oh my gosh. I So I was uh, lucky enough to be invited by Chris Townsend to go to the 18th uh, World Federation Trade Unions, uh, Unionist Conference. And I learned more there than I've learned in my 23 years of life so far. Uh, 
mainly mostly because it, it was it was only working class people. It was working class people who have been in the movement. Some of them, I met a man from Martinique who's only been in the labor movement for six months. He and he's an, a grown man. And then there's people who like George Mavricos, who's been involved for decades. And what I learned mostly was that a lot that the American labor movement has been sidetracked by the government because a lot of that had to do with the Red Scare and the Red Scare definitely was not fair to the labor movement as well because the communist movement is a working class movement and that's something that the American government didn't want to admit. And that's the biggest thing that like was my takeaway was the Red Scare really changed a lot of the American labor movement. And you can see that within Colombia, you can see that within Italy, in France, you can see it within, I mean, there were representatives from North Korea there as well at this conference. And it was eye-opening to see that these people stand up with their coworkers, with their comrades every single day and actually admit that the boss was never with them. And that's not something we've been doing in the United States for a little while. We have been giving the bosses uh, some leeway. And what I learned at the WFTU conference was the bosses are only ever given leeway. We have to stop giving them our leeway because that's not fair to us trying to organize and trying to hold our hold ourselves accountable as well as our corporate overlords accountable. So, and that there was so much to learn at the WFTU conference that I think about it every day. It's been over a month since I've been there, and I feel like I'm learning more just thinking about it every day. And, and that was in Paris? That was in Rome. Oh, in Rome. It was supposed to be held, I believe, in Seoul, South Korea, back in 2020. Um, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it just wasn't, it wasn't a safe move. And that's also what I loved about the WFTU is they truly do put their comrades first. They said, and nobody like was mad at South Korea because they didn't hold the conference during a pandemic. They were thankful that they didn't because the working class citizens who do affiliate to the WFTU saw that the WFTU cares about their comrades, about the people, and not only their comrades, but every working class citizen. And that was like the bigger thing too, is like you saw through all of, there was in, there's always infighting in unions, but the WFTU is just, they squash it. They say, no, that infighting is not helpful when this is a working class issue against the bourgeoisie. So yeah. there's so like, much to always say about that conference. United we bargain, divided we beg. Correct. Yeah. And so uh, uh, Greg, that's the 17th uh, World Federation trade hat you, you have, right? Yeah, this is. So you went to year, you, a couple of years earlier. Where was that? I was in Athens. Place? I was at the one in Athens. Uh, uh, Angel mentioned George Mavrikos, and uh, that's it's very moving because he, uh, he gave up the, uh, uh, the leadership this yeah. year. But uh, he really brought the WFTU, the World Federation of Trade Unions, back to life yeah. after the Cold War. And uh, he, he's just an incredible, incredible organizer, incredible human being. So uh, he'll be missed, but I'm sure others will step up. But it's a rebuilding process, a little of the history. It was created after World War II, and it was virtually everybody. The CIO, Congress of Industrial Organizations, was a member, a founding member, as was the trade union movement in England. But as McCarthyism unfolded in the late 40s, as the Cold War began, there was a split and the World Federation of Trade Unions was banded by the anti-communist. They didn't want to work with any communists because frankly, a lot of the unions were communist led. Historically, unions have been led by communists, they're socialists. And so uh, uh, our union movement went off in an entirely different direction, sort of uh, drifted off into class collaboration and bargaining and all, all the things that, uh, that uh, have created a union movement that's dissipated. You now I think it's 10% of the workforce is union, unionized. And the WFTU uh, withheld this, this notion of class struggle unionism. 
that you operate as a worker, as a member of a class, and you fight for your class. You're not collaborating with, or you're not a partner with. I love when Angel brings up partnership because <laughs> my God, they, they love to tell you you're a partner. And if you buy that, you've lost. Exactly. Right? If you believe you're a partner with the boss, you've lost, give it up, work for nothing. So exactly. they've fought that kind of mentality. And I'm glad to see that young people are getting a chance to experience that. Right. Yeah. That, that really, that really um, elevates, that really gives me a rush to hear these stories. So thank you for that, Angel. Yeah, I mean, for a while in the beginning of our movement too, we were very much so, no, we can negotiate with the bosses. We, that was how we first were thinking. And, but I won my union on March 23rd. I have been waiting for the corporate lawyer to answer my initial demand to bargain for the last two and a half months. That's the same story everybody has in this movement. And especially with being at the WFTU conference, you learn that you and the, <laughs> the proletariat and the bourgeois are two different classes for a reason. The bourgeois made themselves do that to everything. And the young people within the Starbucks movement started to realize that. And we have become a lot more angry with how we started out in saying we can negotiate, we have to negotiate, we have to bargain. That's how, unfortunately, we have to start out, but that's not our end goal. Our end goal is to make sure that we are actually, um, we can win <laughs> against Starbucks corporate and we know it. And we can make sure that when they use the word partner, they're the ones who don't see the money, but the partnership is within the workers. And that's that's the new um, thought process mostly that we're all coming to is if we want to be a partner, then they're not the partner anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so, that is so apparent when you watch these Starbucks corporate events, it, it's a grip. It, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a grift and it's so transparently a grift. I mean, I don't think that star workers are against star Starbucks. No. I mean, they want the company to succeed. You do, you know, you have great coffee, good, you know, you, but th it's an illusion to think that, that this is a, uh, something that the, that, that they're going to give you. It's something sure. that you have to have the power to take. Uh, I think a funny thing that, I might, I might get yelled at for saying this, but um, <laughs> Starbucks truly is a cult. Um, it is a cult. It is a cult mentality. And you learn that through interacting with Starbucks corporate. There were, I had a spy, spy manager, they called them support managers, who was flown in from a different state, who on her going away party, she threw herself she told us in my store that she cares more about Starbucks than her own children and her husband. We have it recorded. That is a cultist mentality. And she's mm. not the only one who thinks that. Right. She's just the one who had the, who wasn't being um, watched in that moment to be like, hey, you can't be saying that. Um, so, and more people are realizing that. And I mean, customers and people have been saying Starbucks is a cult since day one. I mean, you think of people who can't uh, function without their caffeine fix. Um, that, it's usually against Starbucks. It, it is a cultist thing. And that's what a lot of the workers started to realize. It's like we were working for a cult and we can't keep allowing the cult to have power over us. So how do we make sure that this corporation stops having this cultist mentality and starts having a worker first mentality. And that's where the movement's moving now. We realize that we were in a cult um, and the cult had some okay ideologies to which, well, they gave us a good job and they had a good basis to which we can break the cultist ideology and make it a very powerful career for people. Right. Yeah, it, it definitely is a group think when you have the same vocabulary, the same language, um, 
uh, that's permeated with the you know upper management, but they're making money. They're, mm-hmm. they're making a big profit. They're, they're they're looking at that chart of the annual growth and you know it's billions of dollars a year. And is it just too much to ask that some of that wealth be reasonably dissipated to the people that truly are the ones responsible for making the wealth? I I, I don't I don't see what. I, I say this change. a lot, Pat, when we have these podcasts. That's capitalism. Exactly. That's, That's capitalism. capitalism. Not Starbucks. It's capitalism. And capitalism is narcissism. Yeah. It, you can never reason with a narcissist. You can only ever make sure that their voice doesn't have more power over yours. Where, where are you going from here? Angel, what's the deal with you and your your legal issues? And uh, what, what's what's <laughs> next? You're obviously a pretty good spokesperson for this cause, and I'm glad that you are, you need to get out there more. You're very articulate. You're very right on in what you're saying. I appreciate that. There's there's a lot of weird next steps. I mean, I, I am young. I am able to do a whole bunch of things and not get too tired out yet. Um, so like, I'm still organizing. I'm still organizing around the country and I'm not going to stop. And I'm not going to allow Starbucks to keep my job from me as well. I am the point person for bargaining a contract at my store, even though they illegally fired me. I won't let them take that away from me because that's not fair to my coworkers. So that's step one is I am going to continue to fight for my job back. And that fight continues on July 11th um, when Buffalo's uh, court hearing with the NLRB begins. Right now, I do need to have a job in order to support myself in order to continue to organizing. So next step is I think my union rep got me in at a union coffee shop. So the beautiful thing too there is I will not only still be involved in this movement, but I will be making sure that their movement stays strong as well. Um, But the overarching thing is I just want to make sure that like I'm available for people because my store was a training ground for every union busting tactic that Starbucks is employing across the country. I can't keep quiet on that when people are being hurt. That's not fair to other people. So I'm going to keep talking as much as I can to whoever will listen to make sure that not only Starbucks workers feel that they're supported, but every worker feels supported. Um, I Local 36 of the roofers and waterproofers has been showing up down in Southern California helping out because we had that beautiful connection with each other. AFSME 3800 up in uh, Minneapolis uh, is the reason why I got to labor notes particularly. There is more collaboration to be done and I'm going to figure out with my comrades how to make sure that collaboration continues. Right. Right. Are, are, are the customers supportive of the union? A majority of them, yeah, they are. Wow. And it right. is great. I will, so we, just started out this pledge and I will have to send it out to you guys in an email. It is a pledge saying no contract, no coffee. And the uh, working class people who don't work at Starbucks, um, we asked to sign this pledge and help us in our movement. And it helps keep the people informed, but also helps them where like, hey, there's a store who's filing and, you know, they're going through the bullshit right now. Why don't you go in and get a union strong coffee? That's our next step right now. Um, we're going to make sure that the public is involved as well, because the American labor movement will not continue unless every working class citizen is involved. And that's what we're going to make sure happens. That's a great right. strategy. So in other words, you let the public know we're organizing here and you give them a chance to knock up, to come up and say, hang in there. I'm with you. and yeah, get a strong that's the whole point. Oh, yep. that's Solidarity. Good. That's that's kind of sneaky, Angel. That's good. I like that. So. <laughs> it's well, a solidarity forever movement. I know. Of course. Well, you are a breath of fresh air. I would uh, love you to make me a, um, 
unfortunately, I'm pretty easy on my coffee orders. It's just a, 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 a 16 ounce with a little room for cream, and that's my that's mine. But uh, everybody has their own coffee, so. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Angel, and, and just uh, we'll be following you. We'll be stalking you on social media and wishing you all the luck in the world. And uh, boy, you're the right person at the right time. And uh, let's hope this keeps keeps going in the right direction. We will make sure of that every day. I appreciate you guys uh, giving us at Starbucks Workers United a platform. Uh, we want to show up not for ourselves, but for everybody. And we're going to do it every single day and we're not going to stop. Good, good. I know you will. Great, great. Thanks. Thank you. Solidarity forever. Forever.